Hello and welcome to Foolish Musings. In this episode, we'll be examining Zhao Yan and the school of the naturalists that developed in early China. Zhao Yang is seen as essentially the quintessential philosopher of the Yin Yang school, also known as the school of naturalists, which developed during the Hundred Schools of Thought era in Chinese philosophy. Zhao Yang was a noted scholar of the Jixia Academy in the state of Qi, uh, and he used his position uh, to research and understand the natural world. And in some ways, he can kind of be seen as both representative of and the founder of this rich naturalistic school or naturalistic tradition within the broader Chinese philosophical field. Although the naturalist school itself was not particularly influential in the long term, it died out, its ideas were very influential in the sense that they ended up permeating, uh, sort of providing a metaphysical undercurrent, uh, which is in fact still quite important in terms of understanding uh, Chinese uh, folk metaphysics and uh, con conceptions of uh, Chinese uh, si uh, early Chinese sciences, but also Chinese medicine and traditional Chinese medicine practices today. Now. The naturalist school itself uh, has also over time become associated uh, with Taoism, uh, most importantly uh, its ideas uh, which we'll discuss a little bit later with regards to uh, the five elements and yin yang, but also it has become associated with uh, Chinese alchemy and in some ways uh, this means that uh, some of the ideas that have come from the school of naturalists by outsiders are seen as a bit kooky, maybe as a bit of an irrelevant superstition which doesn't really have a place in the world of modern science. What I would argue, however, is that uh, the school of naturalists does actually have something to contribute in terms of understanding uh, a very interesting conception uh, from a metaphysical standpoint of the world. One of the two central doctrines that come out of the school of naturalism is the idea of the five element theory, uh, which I think actually quite favorably compares with some of the early Greek uh, pre-Socratic or early Greek philosopher thought uh, with regards to uh, how nature exists and how the process of generation occurs. Uh, so, in the Chinese naturalist conception of the universe, there is five basic elements. They are fire, metal, water, earth, and wood. Now, each of these individual elements uh, is seen as that very basic composite building block from which the rest of the world is constructed. Very similar to the four element or even five element system that was developed in ancient Greece and then utilized uh, throughout most of the classical and medieval world. Now as with the Greeks, the school of naturalists in China had to deal with the idea of generation and their conception of generation from these five elements essentially came from idea of basically phaseology, a mixture of phases and generation where each of the elements sort of gave way to one another. So in a sense that uh, metal would give way to water because obviously metal would be rusted by water or corroded. Uh, water in its turn would give way to wood because it was absorbed by the wood and the wood was seen to grow because of it. Wood would then give uh, way to fire, in the sense that uh, it would burn, uh, something that was commonly observed. And then fire would give way to earth, in the way that if you heap earth upon a fire, uh, it itself uh, is extinguished. But then also, uh, there was a complex interrelation between uh, these different uh, elements. Each individual element themselves uh, sort of destroying or potentially insulting uh, the other elements, uh, creating a, a sort of a complex interrelation uh, along almost a, a, a trigrammatic feature. And it's these differing elements and their different interactions which become associated with other aspects of earlier Chinese uh, mythology and metaphysics and plays out in things such as the I Ching uh, but also uh, becomes very important in terms of uh, 
aspects of life that you would see day in and day out in classical China, but even through to this day, such as uh, Chinese geomancy, more commonly known as feng shui. Over time, and within this uh, school of naturalistic thought, started by Zhao Yan, the elements became seen not only indicative of the natural process of generation, but themselves uh, much more important and linked to broader cycles on both heaven and earth. So both in terms of understanding celestial astronomy, but also in terms of understanding the cycles of uh, political life that occurred within the Middle Kingdom. As such, uh, each of the individual dynasties would often associate themselves with the element which was the successor element in phaseology following from the element of the previous dynasty, uh, sort of following along with the idea of the shifting mandate of heaven. Now, this is interesting because even though it, it adds a legitimacy to the rule, it also sort of points to a, an understanding uh, within Chinese, uh, well, with these, within this naturalistic school, or this Chinese naturalism school, uh, of the impermanence of nature and how things are always constantly shifting, becoming one another, generating into one another, uh, and, and never necessarily f forming a final phase, never never. Really Reaching a final state, and I think this is rather important because it links very, uh, very directly to the next most important, or one could even say the most insightful aspect of Chinese naturalism: the idea of yin yang. Although the term yin yang doesn't appear in direct reference to Zhao Yan, it is directly linked to him in the sense that the school which he founds is named the Yin Yang School, and in some ways it can be seen at a much more basic level uh, than the Five Elements, which is uh, in some ways a bit more of a sophisticated concept of generation. Yin Yang lays at that, that very basal level, where it, in, in this actual phonology the term Yin just means uh, shady side and yang means bright side and can be used to refer to the uh, shady and dark uh, shady and light sides of a mountain or a hill uh, and in this sense it refers to the two interlocking aspects of nature it uh, the aspects of one thing uh, then essentially generating and turning into another in the sense that uh, you cannot have one without the other Yin Yang uh, symbology is intricately tied to the natural dualisms which Chinese philosophers saw in uh, everyday life, such things as the light and the dark, as I already mentioned, but also things like fire and water, uh, aspects of masculinity and femininity. In fact, uh, masculinity is often linked to Yang and the bright, and femininity is linked to Yin and the dark. Uh, and there has been some arguments that this has actually been a cause, uh, or at least an exacerbating factor, or an underlying explanatory factor for patriarchal societal uh, relations in, cl in classical Chinese through to modern Chinese society. However, in some ways, yin-yang needs to be understood as kind of a contradiction, a, a dualistic Monism, and what I mean by that is an understanding that the world that we interact with is kind of broken out into these dualistic understandings, like you know our conceptions of good and evil, our, our conceptions of movement and stillness, but realistically the two of them are united in like an underlying monism. Uh, in some ways, this is reminiscent of something like Heraclitus, uh, where he sees reality bending back upon itself like a bow to make a, a single whole out of things that we see as being contradicting opposites. In this sense, I think Yin Yang points to a very important and fundamental philosophical argument for a monistic understanding of, of reality that ignores uh, the everyday sensibilities of a, a pluralistic world in which there is many objects seemingly detached from one another. So in conclusion to this relatively short episode, I suppose a good question to ask is, in what ways are these ideas of the five elements or yin-yang important 
both in terms of understanding Chinese philosophy, but also in terms of our understanding of modern philosophy. Why do we care about these besides uh, as historical oddities? Firstly, I would say that the School of Naturalists itself did not survive, but was influential both from a Taoist and a Confucian perspective. The influences of the School of the Naturalists, which seems to draw upon those earlier kind of intuitions that exist in the I Ching, uh, sort of play out in those understandings of uh, the underlying unity of the world, and then also uh, essentially that monistic understanding of common sense or commonplace moralities and phenomenological experience. On the other hand, in the Confucian sense, uh, the school of naturalists provided a metaphysical framework through which books such as the I Ching could be interpreted, but also a, a, a basic understanding of how reality worked, which allowed them to sort of put it to one side and instead focus on those more pressing moralistic and political issues, uh, which we saw with Confucius, and then the unification of those two under the new text school. Uh, and in that sense, I think it's very important in terms of understanding how dominant this conception of reality is throughout the majority of Chinese history. Despite the fact that we have none of Zhao Yang's writings, uh, the ideas of Zhao Yang, the ideas of this uh, school of philosophy, uh, remain extremely important. Uh, even more dominant in Chinese uh, culture than one would suggest the ideas of Aristotle would be uh, in the West, both in uh, the Islamic and the Christian world. And so, to understand the writings of both uh, medieval and late imperial China, we really need to understand the concept, the context, and the, the the concepts that come out of this earlier school. Finally, I'd also argue that even if you don't accept the monistic or the dualistic monistic underlyings of both the five elements or yin yang theories or concepts they still provide an interesting springboard from which one can commence to uh, critique and re-examine one's own metaphysical underpinnings but also the metaphysical frameworks which underpin western and other cultural understandings and conceptions of the world Thank you for listening to the episode. If you enjoyed the episode, please subscribe or follow me at my blog, foolishmusings.com.